My name is Ed Mary Fugier. I'm with Robert McNeil uh, here in Seattle. I'm part of the technical support and training uh, team. I also do uh, product testing and uh, Q&A, and I'm out of the Seattle office. So feel free to email me after the class at mary at uh, mcneil.com. Our schedule for today is to uh, do an introduction to Rhino and the um, real or the problem that we're trying to solve here or the purpose of this training is to help you over what we call the blank screen mode uh, where you look at Rhino and you're not quite sure where to get started. Um, there's so many parts of the screen and once we define what they are you'll feel a lot more comfortable and be able to move uh, more effectively through, uh, through the application. This is Rhino Preschool, so hopefully this will be the uh, ground floor to uh, moving into uh, more advanced Rhino training and webinars, uh, workshop. We'll be uh, covering the parts of the uh, application, parts of the screen first, of course, very, very briefly. Um, but then we're going to uh, move into uh, modeling aids and curves and surfaces and solids and all those wonderful things that uh, make up our model. And our project for today is uh, fairly simple. Um, it is a, a basic uh, architectural model, a fire station, but uh, we'll be able to put to uh, use here all of the uh, modeling aids and the uh, surfaces and solids that we'll be working with as, as well as the uh, orientation command, the surfaces, solids will be moving into rendering of the product uh, as well. So we'll be using the uh, Rhino Render. A uh, Rhino Render is in Rhino. Everybody has. Again, it's uh, a stepping stone to add on renderers. So uh, if you're thinking of using V-Ray or Maxwell or Flamingo, then uh, there are a lot of common uh, parts to all of the rendering applications. So uh, again, it's a uh, simple and uh, it will uh, get us started in looking at a realistic image of our model. Uh, Rhino does do the 3D geometry, uh, and with that uh, geometry, you can render it, you can uh, move it into fabrication, laser cutting, um, 3D printing, but y you can also do the 2D drawings in Rhino. So we have uh, curves and line types and line weights and layouts. You can make title blocks. Um, it's not pre-configured for you know having lots of blocks that you would use for your uh, your annotation um, create your own little block library and uh, automate some of the annotation features that uh, that you want on your layouts or on your drawings there we go okay so um, if you have a folder January 2018 getting started then uh, you'll be able to organize your files pretty well for, uh, for the class. So uh, let's start by talking about what, uh, what Rhino is. And primarily, it's a surface modeling tool. And it started out as a project back in 1994. Uh, we're, we will be using Rhino 5 in this class and Rhino uh, six is uh, under development, although what we do uh, in this class you'll be able to do uh, with Rhino 5 or Rhino 6. So it is, isn't a problem if uh, for some reason you're running uh, Rhino 6, you'll be able uh, to follow along as well. As a uh, surface uh, modeling tool primarily, it was also um, a product design tool. So as the releases of Rhino uh, continued to uh, push the features forward, then we started seeing Rhino being used in marine and architecture uh, and jewelry. So I know um, you are from all of these uh, industries are represented in this class, but the uh, basic tools that we'll be using today, uh, you will use in any model in any industry that, uh, that you are working in. The um, surface is infinitely thin, infinitely flexible. It's mathematically defined. So um, the surface is the, the core object here that we, uh, that we create in Rhino. Surfaces can be joined together into polysurfaces. So 
um, that edge distance between them will determine whether they, uh, they can be joined. And if they're joined together and form a closed volume, then they become a solid. But there are other solids, uh, or there are uh, other solids in Rhino, other closed surfaces uh, like the ellipse, um, the ellipsoid, and the sphere are also surfaces, but they're closed surfaces. So they form that closed volume out uh, in space. And um, curves are also geometry that Rhino can create. There are uh, simple line curves, polyline curves, circles, ellipses, and then our freeform curves. And as those curves get more complex, um, so does their flexibility. So as we move from our degree one line to um, our degree two circles and ellipses, and then onto our degree three and uh, in greater freeform curves, we start to see that flexibility appear in Rhino. Now, curves are important because they are used to drive geometry. So when we take a command like um, extrude or loft, it will be asking us for curves, and uh, those curves are going to be I use to build 3D geometry. And for the most part, uh, Rhino uses um, a uh, acronym called NURBS, Non-Uniform Rational B-Splines. And this is uh, what we use to uh, describe the format that the uh, geometry is stored in. So all of these objects that you're looking at here are surfaces that uh, are NURB surfaces, except this object right here. And this object here is a mesh. And uh, a mesh is not mathematically defined. Okay, It is a boundary representation. And all we really know about the mesh are where those uh, vertices are on the mesh. So it's an approximation of, uh, of an object, but it's still a very important object for a number of re reasons. The mesh is what you send to the 3D printer. So when you create uh, geometry in Rhino, um, you can't just take that uh, closed poly surface and send it out to your 3D printer. Um, what you'll need to do is save that object as an STL file and then import it into your 3D printing software. The other place that meshes are important is um, if you're looking for something to build your scene. So if we wanted a fire truck, for example, here in front of our building, we could go out to Google Warehouse and download uh, a fire truck and put it there. Now, Google Warehouse is uh, for SketchUp, and SketchUp is mesh-based, so our fire truck will be mesh-based. But uh, Rhino is able to insert that and render it and include it in the scene. Uh, it's just not our uh, core NURBS geometry, so it won't have, um, it, we, we won't be able to edit it in the ways that we do other geometry, um, but it works really well for building the rendering scene. So we have a, a question, how long does it take, more or less, to learn Rhino to build product design? Of course, um, thank you for the question. Of course, it uh, depends on what your experience is with other design software. So if you are already using Solid um, SolidWorks or, uh, or AutoCAD even, uh, or SketchUp, then you're going to be able to move much more quickly through Rhino. If Rhino is your first 3D application, it's probably going to take you a little bit longer um, to get used to uh, the, the way Rhino works and um, um, how to produce a good model. Um, and um, I think for the most part, though, um, if I had to put a number on it, I would say it's going to take three to six months for you to uh, to learn uh, Rhino and be uh, proficient with it, moving around it. Uh, and then you'll see that uh, number uh, decrease quite a bit if, 
if you've already used other applications like 3D Studio Max. You'll probably find Rhino is much easier than uh, 3D Studio um, and then also uh, produces surfaces and geometry much, uh, much more efficiently. So uh, anyway, that will be my, uh, my guess, my hypothesis for how long it will take uh, to learn Rhino. Now, you never will know Rhino, though. Rhino is a massive application, and you always have to be willing every day to learn something new. And that may be finding YouTube videos, finding you know videos out on uh, Vimeo, watching the Rhino forum. So a lot of our support is done uh, through uh, through the forum, and you can learn a lot just by watching what other people's questions are. And after a while, you'll start to uh, be able to answer them. So, uh, what is a surface? So if we're going to use surface um, in our definition then we need to be able to define it. And a surface is an infinitely thin, infinitely flexible, mathematically defined digital membrane. Okay, so that's what our Rhino surface is. You're also going to see other objects in Rhino and control points or the control grid is a way to go directly to the geometry and begin to morph it. And uh, with uh, a surface, you can turn on that control grid and begin to pull and morph those points into a free form shape. Okay, and I'll uh, show you a little bit uh, about that, but I didn't really work too much into uh, our basic exercise that uses that control point structure, although we will see it on the curves. Maybe we can create some type of freeform sculpture that will sit out in front of that, uh, that fire station. And uh, you're also going to see text and dimensions and other uh, objects like uh, lights that we're going to use for our rendering. So um, just keep uh, your eyes open for that uh, geometry. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, open up start.3dm and we'll get uh, get working in Rhino. Okay, so go ahead and open that uh, file, start.3dm. If you need to download it, it's on the materials page. Now, I don't expect that you'll be able to do everything that uh, we're going to uh, be doing in class today, especially towards the end. But like I said, we are recording it, so uh, you can come back uh, and go through it again. Um, at a minimum, if you have Rhino open and you're selecting curves and geometry and just getting used to the interface, then um, I will be happy. That will be uh, that will be a win. Okay, and then you can build on uh, filling in the blanks and. Uh, uh, going through it at your own pace with uh, with the recording. So let's just uh, start here with the parts of the screen. And at the top, you can see that I opened the model called start.3dm. So if you're ever wondering, you're watching a video and you don't know what um, file that the instructor has open, you can always look up here to your Windows title bar. Now right below the title bar, we have the menu bar. And it's very efficient to locate commands up here in the menu bar. So for the most part, we'll be selecting the commands from the menu. Uh, we also have toolbars that surround the screen that are also going to give you access to commands. They will take uh, a little bit longer to locate and find. Um, and the help file will be uh, very helpful to reuse, to overuse a term there to uh, help you find, you know, what, uh, what a command looks like over here on the toolbar. And I'll show you that here in a moment. But for the most part, as we're beginning here in Rhino, the menu will be, uh, will be quite efficient to, uh, to get the command started. Now, right below the menu is the command line. And the command line is the most important part of the screen. 
If you learn to read the command line, you will very, uh, very quickly feel comfortable in Rhino. So uh, the command line, if I had to pick what is the most important part of the screen, it would be the command line. And the command line runs up. So the most current line on the command line is the bottom line. Okay, and then as your command moves up, you can use the function key F2 to flip the screen and look at what you just did or what you did a few commands ago. So that is uh, an important key. And of course, F1 in Windows is always help, and that is, is also true in Rhino. Now, below the command line, we have the tabbed toolbars. And the tabbed toolbars are designed this way so that you can pick from the categories and you aren't wasting room on the screen. So as you pick across them, you'll see they'll update. And when you get to surface tools, you have the same commands on surface tools that you have on the surface menu up here. And then you also get the sidebar updating over here, okay? So uh, for the most part, we'll be sticking with standard and, um, and the menu, but from time to time, I'm sure we'll have to use uh, one of those uh, panels across the top. Now, the toolbars, across the top and on the side of the screen. Some of them are just one command. Others are a whole series of commands. But as you put your cursor over the toolbar button, you get a tool tip. So if you're wondering if there are two commands on a button or if there are uh, a right mouse button command, so you can tap the right mouse button here and get the untrim command. Um, the tooltip will tell you that, okay? Now, the other thing is this uh, little arrow. And when you see that little arrow in the lower right corner of a toolbar button, that means that that button is actually an entire series of command. So it's a toolbar. So if you press on it, you can pull out the commands that are in that toolbar. Okay. And you can guide your cursor over them and find which one you want to run. Or you can come up to the bar across the top and pull it away. This is called tearing off a toolbar. And once you get those toolbars tear uh, tore off, then you can arrange them around your screen. Um, you can resize them by pulling uh, the arrow, or you can pick the X and close them down. Okay? So uh, that uh, is uh, a little bit um, about the toolbars, hopefully to make you more comfortable with them. And the area that you see uh, out in the center of the screen here is called the graphics area. And the graphics area is where you're going to be putting your model together. Okay, so um, in the graphics area, we have a series of viewports. And like the name says, they're viewing ports into your model. So you're going to be looking at your model from all these different perspectives. Now, right now, we have a top view, which is our aerial view. We have the front view, which we're looking straight on uh, the front, uh, 90 degrees to the top view. And then we have the perspective, which gives us that vanishing point where we can look at a perspective view of our model. So it's very easy with the perspective view to get a better look at that object in 3D, okay, just by uh, nature of that perspective versus the parallel views, which the top and front are. If you look up here to the standard toolbar, you're going to find a button that is for view. And right now we're looking at three view, but if you pick on this button here, 
you're going to see a couple things. You're going to see the tooltip say four viewports. And if you pick on it, you're going to see the four view command running in the command line. And what four view does is break that graphics area down into the four typical viewing ports. And this is what you see when you begin a model using the templates that are built into Rhino. You see the top, front, and right view. Okay, so the front view has moved over here, and then we have the top view, and our perspective uh, is off to the right as, uh, as it was before we took four view, but now we have the right view. So we're looking 90-90 to the top view with the right viewport. And there are three parallel viewports, top, front, and right by default. There are additional views. If you go up to the viewport menu, you will see a set view, and you can pick from these other built-in views. Instead of just top, we have bottom. Instead of left, we have right, we have front, and we have back. Okay, so those are on the menu. Now, if you notice something I did here, I double click to maximize the viewport. And I did that kind of in error, but it's a really good thing to point out here that you can double click to maximize a viewport to the screen. So if I want to change the top from top to bottom, I could go to set view and down to bottom. Now I'm looking at the bottom view of the model. Okay. And if I want to set it back to top, I can do that again. Now we said that there were three parallel views, the top, front, and right, and they're going to follow a little bit different rules than the perspective will. So let's take a look at navigation, because navigation will be dependent on what type of view we have, what the projection is for that viewport. So starting out in the top viewport, you can use the wheel on your mouse to zoom. Okay? And if you go to the front and the right, that will be the same. And the wheel also works in the perspective view. Now, hopefully you have a three button mouse. If you don't, you should get one as you spend more and more time on Rhino. Uh, you can also zoom by holding down the control key and using the right mouse. So if I type this in up here for the video, control plus right mouse button uh, will equal zoom. Okay, so if you don't have that wheel mouse or you're using a keypad, you can control plus right mouse button to zoom. And that will be the case in all of the viewports, um, irregardless of the projection. Okay, let's take a look at panning. And after I zoom, I may need to pan the view so I can see something a little bit better. And that's the right mouse button. Okay, so if uh, I go back to my text here, pan is equal to the right mouse button. So if you use that right, right mouse button in the parallel viewports, you will be able to pan. So give that a try. Combine it with the wheel, zoom, pan, zoom, pan. But watch what happens when I get to the perspective view. In the perspective view, the right mouse button rotates the view. Okay, so it tumbles that view. So in the perspective view, the right mouse button does not pan. So what if I want to pan? Then I need the shift key. So in the perspective view, in order to pan, you need to hold down the shift key plus the right mouse button. Okay, and that will get you your panning in the perspective view. Okay. Shift, 
right mouse button. So you should be able to move quite effectively now around your model. Okay. There is an option though that will lock your parallel viewports together. So right now as I'm zooming and panning, the parallel views are not synchronized. Okay. If you want them to be synchronized, then we have to take a look at an option in Rhino to link the viewport. So let's go to options. And options can be quite intimidating the first time you go into uh, options. But let me simplify it for you just a little bit here. And when you're in options, there are really two parts to options. The top part, which will be saved options here, will be saved in your document. Okay, so in the Rhino file that you're putting together, if you change anything up here, it will be remembered in your file. The lower half, or two-thirds of options, is saved on your system. So if you make any changes down here, then your Rhino system will remember it. So the change that I'd like to have you make here will be in view. And if you go down and pick on view and put the check mark in linked viewports, then what you're changing down here will be remembered on your system. So I'm going to pick OK. And now take a look at what happens to the parallel views. All the parallel views are linked together. Okay, so any zooming or panning that I do in the parallel views will synchronize each of the parallel views. Now, I've been saying that a few times for a reason because perspective is not part of this synchronization party. Okay, it's left out, so it will not be synchronized with the other views. Okay, so just be aware of that. Uh, let's take a, a look at some basic uh, moving and copying here in, uh, in Rhino. Um, if you have an object, oh, and let me do one other thing here before, uh, before we do the, uh, the basic editing of, uh, of geometry. Uh, let's take a look at the perspective uh, viewport. And right now we're looking at the geometry in wireframe. Okay, and wireframe is a display mode, and the display mode controls how you're going to display the model. Now, whether you are looking at a simple model like this, which um, you know, doesn't really have much meaning um, in, uh, in the real world, or if you have a jewelry model or architectural model, marine model, um, you can take that model and look at it in different ways. So Let's come up here to perspective, and you can see that we're in wireframe mode. Okay, let's pick shaded. And when I go into shaded, the objects appear, um, and the surfaces and solids appear shaded in the layer color. Now, they're all on a layer called objects, so that we can organize what parts of the model we're viewing or editing or printing. Um, so you can see them a little bit better here in shaded mode, you can look at how the surfaces take shape. There are other options to shaded. So shaded, it can be really helpful to have the perspective view in shaded mode and the other viewports in wireframe, okay? Because you get a very good idea how your model is developing. There's also an option called rendered, okay? Let's go to rendered. And this model has been set up with materials assigned to these objects. So when I go into rendered mode, I can see them in the materials previewing like they will be when they are rendered. And also take a look at this. Okay, There's a shadow. If you don't see a shadow when you're in rendered mode, then it could be a problem with your video card that we'll, uh, we'll have to discuss outside of class. Okay, So you may need an update to your video driver. Or your video card just may not be 
uh, able to do this advanced display mode because it uses the OpenGL on your card. But it is something good to, uh, to know about. If I come up here and pick Render, then Rhino renders, and I'll move that window over here for you, it renders in those materials. And that's why we call this a render preview. And there was a, a, a previous version of Rhino that would actually call the render mode render preview. Now, I want you to be uh, good Rhino detectives here, and let's find out where that material is being assigned. So when I pick on the cube, it turns yellow. And in Rhino, yellow is the highlighting color. And if I come over here to Properties, you can see that the box is a closed poly surface. You can also see that it's on a layer called Objects. And if you pick on this page of Properties, you will see what material is assigned to that box. And it is assigned a blue material, and it has a gloss finish of about 50%. Now if you want it glossier or if you want it more reflective like metal or if you want to make it transparent you can change the materials here that are assigned to that object. Okay. And if you pick on the cone you can see it's magenta. Now we haven't named the material but we could. We could call it magenta plastic. Okay, so now the material has a name. Okay, and if I come back to it, instead of just being called unnamed, it now is magenta, and we could call this one green plastic. Okay, and now it has a name, and as well as the red. And I can use this material and assign it to other objects in Rhino. And I can also assign it to layers. Okay. So I just want to show you where those materials are co coming from. You can get to other display modes like Ghosted that looks at the color of the layer. So if I come here to the layer and I change the layer color to blue, you will see that that shaded looks at the color of the layer. Now this uh, part of the screen. I think I neglected to, uh, to share that with you. These are called the panels. And there are many panels that you can open up here. We just have uh, a few. So if you right click on the panel, you can open up additional panels. Okay? And um, you can close down panels uh, too that, uh, that you're not using. Uh, let's see, I'll turn down off ground plane for now, uh, but uh, I do have uh, a panel open here um, where it's a web browser, and if you browse to this page, there's a nice little review of the Rhino Essentials. Okay, so little videos that go over uh, the first part of class here. So I have that in my uh, web browser. I also got a little bit uh, distracted here and uh, I didn't point out the uh, panel uh, down at the bottom here that has tabs for the different viewports. It's a good time right now with this viewport maximized to, uh, to show that. We also have object snaps that will be uh, taking a look at to snap onto existing geometry. And then the last part of the screen here, so I can finish this up, is the status bar. And the status bar has a readout for your coordinates that lets you know the, the units of the file, the layer that you're on that we'll be talking more about. And then also all of these modeling aids. And there is a little bit of configuration you can do on that status bar by right clicking. So over here on the panel we went to the object layer and we changed it to blue and when we did that all of the objects are shaded in that blue color. Okay. Now why do we have layers? Uh, we have layers so that we can very quickly change the 
visibility of objects. We can also lock objects so that they can't be selected. Like this plane here is on a locked layer, so I can't pick it. Okay, and I can assign color, material, and line type to, uh, to the layers. Okay, and of course, line type is only applied to 2D geometry, uh, like circles and polylines that we'll be getting uh, into here in a moment. Now, even though we have these three layers in this uh, file, uh, we can make more and uh, only one layer can be active at one time. So if I right click up here and create a new layer, I'll create a layer called curves since we're going to be creating curves. And if you right click again to do new layer, I'll make a layer called surfaces and I'll hit the tab key and then I can make a layer called solids and uh, a layer called dimensions, let's say. Okay, so the tab key helps us make uh, many layers at one time. I'll make the curve layer blue. I'll make the surfaces layer uh, magenta. I'll make the solid layer green and I'll leave the dimension layer as black. So now these are part of the file and if you want to go up to file, you can um, not risk saving over this, but you can save as. And I'll pick save as, and I'll call this start two. And just by putting a two at the end of there, I will have start to uh, uh, start two, and I've preserved start. Okay, so a couple uh, couple questions. Uh, what is the main difference between Rhino for Mac and Rhino for Windows? That's a good question. Uh, and uh, I'm also doing a getting started with Rhino for Mac on Friday. And there's still room in it if you, uh, if you want to, uh, to show up. You'll have a better idea of what the differences are. It's the interface. Rhino's the same. And what I like to start out my level one Rhino for Mac class is uh, by telling students that they're learning Rhino. They're not learning Rhino for Mac. And, and that can be true as well in our Rhino for Windows class. You're not learning Rhino for Windows. You're really learning Rhino. Now, whether you um, use Rhino for Mac or Rhino for Windows, you may not have the choice. You may um, get hired at a company and they're a Mac shop, so they're going to give you Rhino for Mac. Um, and you may quit that company and go to another company and, and use Rhino for Windows or use Rhino for Windows at home. So um, you may find yourself going back be forth between them. The interface has a little bit uh, of um, idiosyncrasies that are very Mac-like, so if you are a Mac user, you'd be very comfortable with them. If you're not a Mac user, then you're going to have to get more comfortable uh, with the Mac in order to uh, be able to use Rhino for Mac. So the geometry part, creating surfaces, solids, all that is the same. The interface is different. Now, one of the other differences, the um, two things that are quite different are the renderer has, um, again, a few little um, idiosyncrasies that you're going to find between uh, Windows and Mac. Um, layout, the layout area, um, again, is put together different, on, uh, but the concepts are the same. Just the interfaces on those two uh, commands are different. And then you're going to find, because of the age of Rhino for Windows, there's a lot more of the plugins that are available. So plugins extend Rhino beyond what it does. So um, as an architectural designer, I can download um, a plugin called Visual Arc, and I can add windows and um, roofs and walls and uh, some other um, architectural uh, uh, scheduling and um, BIM to Rhino, because Rhino doesn't have that. Okay, Rhino is your basic set of tools um, with, uh, you know, a few commands that you can kind of get there with, but they would take you a long time compared to using an add-on. If I'm a jeweler, 
then I'm going to go take a look at probably a Rhino Gold or Matrix to um, help with some of the tedious things that I have to do with my jewelry. Or maybe I just want a library of materials and I want to talk about the model like a jeweler does. I want to talk about the shank and the size of the gem and the ring size and I want all of those built in. So that's what the plugins can do for you. They can add terminology that you're familiar with uh, instead of just talking about boxes and cones and cylinders and spheres, you can talk about things in uh, terms of your industry. So you'll find a lot more plugins available for Windows, although the Mac does have a plugin platform and hopefully we'll see things like uh, V-Ray out for Rhino for Mac. I think Maxwell is already out on, uh, on the Mac and then uh, hopefully we'll see Visual Art for uh, the Mac sometime soon. Uh, what is the difference when you apply material to the layer tab and the properties? Well, the difference is that the material, when I apply it to the layer, is assigned to all of the objects on that layer. So if I go here to material and I pick from new here and I go to the library and I grab a uh, plastic material and uh, let's say I grab, just for fun, a textured plastic. Okay, pick OK. And now when I come back out here and I look at the rendered view, you're like, oh, Mary, you just assigned the material to that layer. Why don't you see it? Well, the reason why I don't see it is that these objects here are assigned material by object so I need to apply them back to the layer and now when I do that you can see that material that plastic with the texture is showing up on all of those objects but I don't want that material on the cube so I can go back here to set the material by object and I can pick from one of the materials that are in the model um, and let's say I pick green plastic Okay, so the object is allowed to have its own material if you assign it by object, and if you assign it by layer, then all of those objects are going to take on that material. So I hope that to helps out, and I'm going to use my magic undo button, and the undo button is going to bring me back in time to before I assigned that material to the layer. Okay, so this will help us having these layers here that we can organize our model uh, with. Now, um, I don't have to um, assign the layers as I'm to the objects as I'm creating them. So let's say I pick on this box and I want it to be on the solid layer. I can go to Properties and I can change its layer and there's a couple ways to do this. So I don't want you to think by any means that that's the only way. Um, but this object is now on the solid layer. So if I go to layer and I turn off the object layer, then everything but the solid goes away. And if I turn off the solid layer, then just that cube goes away. Now, changing the layer didn't affect the material, okay, especially the object that had the material assigned, and all of these have the material assigned by object. So changing the layer uh, did not affect the material. Um, if I rewind back to when I had the objects that had their material assigned by layer, then yes, changing the layer would affect the material. And this layer has no material assigned but default, so they would lose that textured plastic. Okay, so let's take a look at some simple editing here. And uh, now that we know a little bit more about, uh, about the model, and you can see the object here is taken on the color of the layer in the wireframe mode, and that's what we would uh, expect. Although you can override the object color as well in properties, but we will um, just uh, leave that for now. What I want you to see here is that you can move objects in Rhino by just picking them up and dragging them. Rhino is designed so you can be as accurate as you want to be. Now, if I want to move this object 10 units to the right, I can do that, or 10 units to the right and 3 units up. Rhino is very accurate when you want to be. 
if you just want to very quickly move something around, Rhino's happy to let you do that as well. So you can drag things around just uh, by using uh, the Windows uh, drag kind of uh, methodology. Um, you can also copy objects by using the Windows copy and paste. So I can copy and paste. And now when I move that cone, you can see I have a second one. And I can take this cylinder and I can copy and paste. And when I paste it, that second cylinder is right on top. If you're a, a shortcut person, you can use your window shortcuts here. This is another place that the Mac is different. Control C, Control V are our windows shortcuts and then I can move them along. Okay, so that is just support of the clipboard. But Rhino has a fabulous tool called the gumball. And when you turn the gumball on, and if you could turn everything else off down here, that would be great. So clear the deck down here um, of your other modeling aids and just turn the gumball on. The gumball is a widget that you can use to move, copy, scale, and rotate. So without having to go through the commands, um, you can um, just uh, use the gumball. Okay. And let's see, I'm just looking over here at the questions for a moment before I continue. Uh, when you apply, okay, we did that one. What is the difference when you apply material to the layer tab and the product? And I think we did that too. Okay, sorry, I thought it was a new uh, new question. Again, we'll open it up at the end for open mic questions. So if you're not shy and you have a mic, we can um, take your questions uh, then as well. Okay, back to the gumball. So the gumball is on. So what is the gumball? Well, when I pick on the uh, object, and uh, I look at the um, object, it appears with the gumball. And um, we're doing move, copy, scale, and rotate here. Um, at the end, we can talk about a line, but it's a combination of those three. So you really have to understand these before you do a line. So we'll see uh, if we can uh, do that at the end. So make sure and remind me uh, about a line and I'll give you uh, a short uh, introduction. The um, gumball is used, like I said, to move. So you can pull the box to move it, okay? and you can pull it in all three directions. So you'll notice that the gumball has arrows that point out in the X, Y, and Z orientation of the current construction plane that that object is on. So I want you to give that uh, a try. And I also want you to see something else about the gumball. You can pick on the arrow and type in a number. I'll type in five. And the object moves five units in that direction. Okay, so if I pick on the green and I type in minus five, it moves a negative five units in that direction. And I can also pick on the blue arrow and type in five, and it moves five units in that direction. So like I said before, Rhino can be as accurate as you want it to be. Okay. Otherwise, you can just drag it along or you can build some accuracy in uh, with tools like the gumball. So that is, uh, is move, but I also want you to see this. As you move the objects by dragging and you tap the Alt key, you get copy. So let me go ahead and bring up my, uh, my text here. If you tap the Alt key, Alt equals copy with the gumball. Okay, so give that uh, a try. Whichever direction you are moving in, if you tap the Alt key, then you will copy. And you can use the gumball on more than one object. So if you pick this object, you can hold down the Shift key, and Shift in Windows is multiple select. And when you get both of those selected, you can move them 
or you can copy them by tapping the Alt key. Okay. So that's uh, move, copy. We also have our technical move and copy commands up here. And you can also get the um, help on these commands. So if you take move, make sure and look over here in your help file and watch the video on move. One of the questions was about align. You can take transform align and you can get help on align over here or any other command that you're looking for help in. So this help window is really important. It also will tell you where to find commands. And this is one of my favorite parts of a command. If I go up here to surface and take loft and I want to know where that command is, it will tell me here. So it's in the surface creation toolbar and I can get an idea how it looks. Okay, so that's what the button looks like. If I go here to Surface Tools and I look over here now, it's really easy to find the loft command. Okay, so make sure and uh, uh, take, uh, take a look at help. And let's go uh, back over to how to use specify the distance. When uh, you don't do it when you're dragging, uh, you do that with the gumball. So um, the two ways to do uh, distance is to type here. I can type in 10, okay, and I can move it 10 units in that direction. Okay, so uh, again, use that arrow to type in the distance. Okay, so that's only with move. So what if I wanted to copy something at a specific distance? And you can control C, control V to copy. And you can take the second copy here and move it five units. Okay, so copy first and then use your gumball to move. And scaling and rotating are also um, other options that you have here with the gumball so if you pick on the box, you can pick on the scale widget, and the scale widget will scale the object in whatever direction that you pick. You can also type in a scale factor. So if you pick here, you can type in two, and it will get twice as big. You can type in 0.5. Okay, so the scale widget allows you to type in a scale factor. Okay, and the only other thing that I want to show you about the gumball today is that the gumball uh, allows you to rotate, and you can rotate it around just by dragging that arc. You can rotate it in any plane. Or you can undo that and you can type in a rotation angle. So I'll type in 45, okay, and it rotated it 45. Okay, so that's all I want to, uh, to do with the gumball right now. And let's take a look at curves. And you'll be able to use the gumball uh, editing with any geometry. So that means curves, surfaces, solids, even dimensions, annotation objects like text, lights will uh, be uh, available to, uh, to Gumball Edit. And you'll also find help uh, on Gumball uh, in the help. Okay, so take a look at that. That will be part of your, your uh, homework for this class. I'm going to go over here to Layers and make the curves layer current, and I'll turn off the plane layer and the objects layer. And uh, for now, I can grab these solids here, and I'm going to change their layer. And one way to change their layer is over here. I'm gonna move them back to the objects layer. 
Another way to do that when you have objects highlighted is you can come down here to your status bar and put those back on the objects layer. Now that objects is turned off, then those objects are also turned off. So let's take a look at drawing a, a few curves. So I'm going to double click to maximize the top view. And uh, let's take a look at the line curve. So if you take the line curve, you can pick anywhere for that curve to begin. And we don't have any modeling aids set here, but we'll get into those here in a moment. As you're picking the endpoint for the line, you can pick uh, anywhere. And you can draw that line. The line command that we're in is polyline. So the polyline isn't going to uh, end. It's going to allow you to keep picking points. And the polyline command was from over here. Um, as you're picking points, you can also undo those points by clicking on the option up here in the command line. Undo. And you also have an option called close. Okay. If you tear off the curve toolbar or if you uh, type in line, the line command is just one single line. Okay. Compare that to this. Put your cursor over lines. By tapping the right mouse button, you get the lines command, which as you're using it, doesn't look too much different than the polyline command. But I'm going to show you the difference here next. So it also has an undo and a close. So here is the set of lines that we created with the line command. They're not associated together. Okay? Although they do share an endpoint and they can be joined. When I pick on the polyline, it's one object. It's joined together into a closed curve. It turns out that you can convert a set of lines into a polyline, and you can convert a polyline into a set of lines. And the commands that we're going to use to do that are join and explode. So if I pick on the polyline, and I go over here and pick explode, then it will explode the polyline down into its individual segments. So now it is just a collection of lines. It's not a polyline. To join lines together into a closed polyline, we use the join command. And I can pick all of them by doing a window, by dragging out in the open where nothing is. Okay, once I get those selected, and again, you can go either way, although this is a crossing window. Okay, and this is a enclosed window. And an enclosed window, when I pull to the right, I only get objects completely selected. But when I do a crossing window, anything that is crossed gets selected. Okay, so let's get those lines selected. And then come over here and pick Join. Okay. When you pick on Join, all the lines will be joined together. Okay, and now we've done what we set out to do. We have a polyline here, and we have a set of lines here. So far, we've been just drawing lines with no help at any angle. So let's take a look at our first modeling aid called ortho. And if I take the polyline command now, and I drag my cursor over here, I'm going to type in a coordinate where this polyline will start. 0, 0, we'll start it at the origin. I could also type in 10, 20. And if I wanted it at a Z elevation of 5, I could type in 5. Okay, So the coordinate that you type in is in the format of X, Y, Z, and it is absolute. Here's a shortcut, though. 
you can just type in zero and when you type in zero Rhino will start at the origin. Now look at what happens with ortho on. My cursor movement is restricted to horizontal or vertical. And I can just draw a few lines there, any size. And when I'm done, I can close that back up again. If you right click on ortho though and go to settings, then you can change your ortho angle to increments instead of 90, which yours is set to right now. I have mine set to 45. So set yours to 45. And now when you do your polyline, and this time to start on the grid, I'm going to turn on grid snap. And now I have not only ortho on, but I have grid snap. And if I want to draw this line 10 units, I'll type in 10. Okay. And if I type in 10, then I have to pick to actually have Rhino draw at that distance. 5, 10, 5, enter, pick, 10, enter, pick. 5, enter, pick, and I can use my snap to come all the way down to the bottom and close. Okay. Now, one of the problems about that I'm seeing here with using distance is that I don't really get to see the distance that we're traveling. So take a look at this. Go to Options, and in Options, under Modeling Aids, go ahead and pick on cursor tooltips and put the check mark in cursor tooltips. And what's going to happen is as you're drawing, Rhino's going to show you the distance that you're traveling from the last point. And I have three checked, O snap distance, relative point, and angle. So if you can go ahead and do those as well. The great thing about this is that your Rhino will remember this. And once you have these turned on, you don't have to turn them on for every session. Okay? So pick OK. And let's take a look at what happens here. If I pick polyline and I pick a start point and I drag my cursor up, you can see orthos trying to restrict cursor movement. And I type in 25 then I can see that on the tooltip. So 6.5, I find that very helpful. Okay, now we are in millimeters, but what if I wanted to draw a line that was one inch? I can type in one followed by inch, and Rhino will convert it into the millimeter equivalent, which is 25.4. So remember that when you're uh, drawing, if I type in 0.5 inch, then again, Rhino will convert it into that unit system. Okay, and with ortho on, you can use uh, and snap. You can possibly even use your uh, feedback here to draw at a specific distance or at a specific location and close and undo, of course, our options on that command line. So um, snap grid, ortho, uh, snap grid, if you right click on it, you can go to settings and configure your grid and your snap spacing. So if you don't want to snap at 0.5 millimeter, you could change this to one. And when you pick OK, and go back out again as you go to draw um, any geometry. In this case, uh, we've been doing polylines. Uh, you will see that you're now snapping at a whole millimeter, not a half. Okay. There are uh, other uh, geometry um, and curves that, uh, that we want to take a look at here. And of course, we're going to move uh, into surfaces uh, and solids here real uh, real shortly. Um, circles, 
uh, many options here. Again, you can reference uh, the help file, but you can pick a center point. You can use your snap grid to, uh, to help pick that uh, radius. You can also toggle between radius and diameter, or you can type it in. So if you just want to type in five here, you will have a circle of radius five. And um, you can also draw ellipses, pick the uh, center and the major, major and minor axes, and you will have your ellipse curve. And the power of these curves is how we're going to move them into surfaces and solids here in a moment. So uh, let's go over to uh, layer. And I want to make a new layer. And I'll call it freeform because I want to uh, take a look at the freeform curves, uh, interpolated point curve and control point curve. Um, as we were doing, even, even the uh, other geometry here, um, one thing that um, we want to point out here is that we have tools to snap onto existing geometry. And if I pick on O-snap here and I put the check mark and endpoint, then when we draw our circle, instead of just drawing it out on the control grid, we can draw it at an endpoint. If you put the check mark in midpoint, then when you draw your circle, Rhino will try to snap to the midpoint or the endpoint or whatever location that, uh, that you pick on. Now there is center, and our center with a closed curve is going to snap to the center or the centroid of that curve. So you'll see that happening. You can uncheck any of the O snaps that uh, are getting in the way. And uh, the uh, circle and arc curve have quadrants. And um, you can also snap tangent to a circle, arc, or uh, freeform curve. Okay, so there's a, a whole variety of O-snaps here that will take a little bit of time after the class. So for homework, I'd like you to go through each of those. But we'll be adding more as we're completing our project for, uh, for the day. So what I wanted you to see here with the freeform curves, and there are two, so I'll tear off my curve toolbar. You'll also find these up under curve and down under free form. So we have our control points curve and our interpolated uh, points curve. And uh, when we do the uh, curve, let's do the first one here, which is a control points curve. As you're drawing your curve, the curve is allowed to pull away from the points that you pick. So you can see kind of the curve that I'm ending up with here. Um, the, other than the start and the end point, uh, this curve is allowed to pull away from the control point grid structure. Let's compare that to the interpolated points curve. The interpolated points curve, as you pick points, the interpolated points curve is forced to go through the points that you pick. Okay, so its control points when we evaluate them by turning points on, you can see that although the uh, control points on that curve are off the geometry, the curve itself still intersects the points that, uh, that you selected. Those are actually edit points. And it does reevaluate and space them out. But you can see in some cases that edit point uh, is even going to show up at the location that we picked. But that can't always be uh, guaranteed because the points are smoothed out and reevaluated. So these are our freeform curves. And freeform curves are going to lead us to freeform geometry. Okay, so uh, let me do a control points curve here. And the control point curve is allowed to pull away. And there are times, and this will just take a little bit of experience, maybe watching a few other videos. There are times when you're going to find that this is the curve you want because you have more control, or this is the curve you want because it matches up with points that you're 
tracing. Okay, so that will take a little bit to, of work to uh, get used to those curves and be able to predict which one you want to use. But in general, this can be a little smoother, and this is good when you're tracing something. Okay, uh, let's uh, go back to our perspective view. And what we want to do now is to take some of this curved geometry and start turning it into 3D solids. Okay. And if you uh, look here in the perspective uh, view here, we have the uh, render view. I'm going to set it back to shaded. Hopefully you can see that a little bit better. And uh, I'll make the solid layer current. So uh, let's start out. Um, actually, let me make the surface layer current. Let's start out with a simple surface. Up under surface, we have a surface from planar curves. So any of the planar curves that are also closed, I can make a surface out of. Okay, now the first... Uh, a uh, question on the final exam for today is what is a surface? A surface is infinitely thin, infinitely flexible, mathematically defined digital membrane. So when you're looking at this surface, it doesn't have any volume, okay? And that is by definition. If we go to our solid menu and we come down to extrude planar curve straight and we pick on a similar curve, and we type in a distance to extrude it to, let's say, 5, then this solid does have volume. Okay, So um, it is actually composed of multiple surfaces. So it's a special surface. It's an extrusion. Okay, So it's a special closed poly surface called an extrusion, and you'll see that over here. Now, the beauty of an extrusion is that if you go up to um, Analyze and down to Mass Property and Volume, you can come up with the volume in the current units. Okay, And that would be true of any solid or any extrusion. If you go to Solid, as well, you will find a command called extrude surface. And if you pick on the surface that we just created here, you can extrude it straight or you could extrude it tapered. So I'm going to extrude this to a height of 2. And now you have a poly surface that was uh, created from that surface. Okay, but it's also a closed volume. So if I right-click up here and go to volume, I get the volume in the current units. Now another uh, option that uh, I have here, I can go to surface and extrude curves straight. And if I do that with a closed uh, or open curve, either one, it will work. It extrudes that curve into a poly surface. And it's actually, again, a special poly surface called an extrusion that's stored very efficiently. But essentially, it is a poly surface. And you can extrude any of these curved surfaces, or, or you can extrude them into uh, a surface. The ellipsoid curve here now uh, becomes a surface. And uh, another command that you can use to... Uh, create a solid. I'm going to go back to my layer here and make the solid layer current. Under solid, I can pipe the curve and I'll put in a uh, radius of 2 and enter twice and now I have a solid pipe ar along that freeform curve. And another option that Pipe offers is you can pick different radiuses. So I could do a 1 here. Okay, I, I could do a 2 at the end. And I could pick here and do a 3. Okay, I'll enter and enter again. And now I have a Pipe extrusion. Okay. Any of these... Um, You'll have to work on that uh, rounded uh, um, 
extrusion is only flat, so you'll have to build a surface at uh, the top of the uh, uh, geometry that, uh, that has some curvature to it. Uh, there is a command in, uh, and there's multiple ways to do that. Two rail sweeps are good. But up under surface, there's a command called patch. And with patch, I'll pick on that uh, top uh, curve. And you can see how it builds a nice patch surface. It does have a lot of options. You're going to have to look into those. Um, but you can see that just very quickly, it creates a nice rounded surface. Okay, so hopefully uh, that answers uh, your, uh, your question. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to show you is that you can pick on this uh, object here and you can cap it into a solid. So that's also a closed solid. To remove a surface, you can extract the surface. So I can extract this surface here. Okay, and now I have an open poly surface. And another option that I have in Rhino is a command called shell. And up here under solid tools, um, there's a command called shell. You can type it in. It's one of uh, a command that you will not find on the menu. A thickness of one, I'll shell out this poly surface. So it now has a shell thickness of one on all three sides. And the side that I pick to stay um, is open. Or I'm sorry, the side that I pick to go away is open. So that's removed. And this command is called shell. Okay, so after the class, any command that you want to um, take uh, a look at, you can type in shell. And you can go over here to uh, help, and it will talk about the shell command and all of its options. Okay. Great. Um, there is also a fillet edge command that will round out your edges. So up under solid and down to fillet edge. A radius of one will probably work, and you can pick on all your edges. You can also pick them with uh, a window if you get in uh, the right view, and you can create a nice rounded edge there. Now, an option when you use fillet edge is that you can do a variable fillet. So um, it, it is pretty complex. It doesn't just, uh, just do a constant radius. But uh, what I want to do here is pick all of the edges on this box. So I want to get the horizontal and the vertical edges. Okay, and when I do that, it creates a real nice fillet at the corner. So fillet edge is what you want to use for poly surfaces and solids. And again, you can get uh, additional help on that. This is still a closed poly surface. So if I go to um, a command called what will actually tell you about that object. It is a closed poly surface or you can go over here to properties and find out that it is a closed poly surface. Okay. Um, I'm going to delete the pipe and I'll go to my surface layer and I can extrude this curve straight to come up with a surface. And let's take a look at uh, one of the options here with, uh, with extrude. And if I go back to standard here and I turn on the control points for this curve, and I start moving those control points, notice how the extrusion does not update. It stays at the way it was when we created the extrusion. Okay. What I'm going to do instead before I do the extrusion is I'm going to turn on history. And when I turn on history and I do the command, and you have to turn it on by default before you run the command, or you can turn it on during the command, once you extrude with history on, then there's a relationship between the curve and the surface in that if you change the curve, 
then the surface will update. And this feature is called history. Not every command supports history, but a lot do. And extrude does. So this is a great place to see how history is going to work for us. So I don't have to recreate the surface. By changing the curve, it updates the surface. Now, what you don't want to do is update the surface. So if I take the surface and I try to move the surface, then history will break. Or do anything with the surface. Rebuild it um, would also delete the history. Okay. So um, extrude is a command that supports history. So does pipe. So if I take our pipe command, and I'm doing that by right-clicking up here on the command line, and I pick the pipe. I'll make sure history is on. I'll pick on the curve. I'll put in just uh, a um, radius of 1. I'll change this to ghosted. And now if I pick on this curve and turn on control points, watch what happens to the pipe. Okay. And that's because of history. If you want to know what commands support history, take your help window and type in history. And when you do, at the bottom of help on history, you can find out all the commands that support history. Okay. Now, pipe has an option in it. If you go back to pipe, and we can turn history on, and I pick on the uh, pipe. Pipe has an option for cap, none, flat, or rounded. And if I turn it to rounded, then it will create the pipe with a round on the end of it. Okay. Now, I don't remember if I uh, uh, had history on, but this will, yeah, I did. Okay. Hopefully that, uh, that gives you um, a really good idea of how you can be uh, use history to uh, to be powerful in uh, in Rhino. Um, to turn the points on, you have to highlight an object and pick over here on points on. You can also hit your F10 key. So if I pick on that polyline and hit F10, then points come on. Okay, F10. I'll do this for the video. F10, okay, will be points on, okay. Or you can pick that button. Okay, uh, let's take a look at a couple other options that uh, I have here with this curve. And uh, one of the um, options that I have is a revolve, and I can revolve this into a surface. If I pick on the endpoints of the object, then it will be a closed poly surface. If uh, I pick on um, away from those endpoints, then I'll have an open poly surface. So uh, let's go up here to surface and revolve. And I'll pick two points for the revolve axis. If I had something to snap onto, that would be nice. But I don't, so I'm just picking uh, picking those uh, two points. When I start the revolve, it wants to know what the start angle is. Zero is the default. And I can go zero to 360, or I can just pick on full circle. So I'm just going to pick on full circle. And when I do that, I get a surface that's created from that curve. Now, uh, Revolve does support history, but I have to turn it on before I do the Revolve. Okay, so or during the Revolve is actually okay now, but in the beginning it wasn't. So get re record history on, take Revolve. You can pick on the endpoints or you can pick off of the curve and Revolve 0 to 360. Okay. So now, I have a surface that will update with control point editing the curve. 
and I am in ghosted mode. If you haven't uh, tried that, go ahead uh, and do that. Uh, I'm going to turn on the control points, and now when I begin pulling them, you can see how it changes the surface. Okay, so that control point to editing of the original curve is used to update that surface. Okay, so that was a surface uh, of revolution. Uh, we'll be um, using all of these surfaces and more in the next exercise. I've saved this as start two, so I can just go ahead and save. Uh, let's see, um, can I open the object and put points on it? Um, what you can do, now this object here has control points, so I can turn control points on it. But because I used history, if I start editing the control points directly, watch what happens. History will break. And if that's okay with you, it's okay with me. Okay, you can turn history off and you can begin to sculpt this object using control point editing. Okay. So everything has control points, but when you have that uh, special relationship that, uh, that we had with uh, the curve by uh, going directly to the control points to uh, edit that surface, uh, you will be deleting that history. And this wasn't really the best uh, place for me to uh, select those control points. If I highlight the object and zoom selected and then turn on control points, um, I can much um, easier, much better uh, to select them here okay, in, uh, in the front view. Uh, you can also uh, remove selected control points okay, that you end up with. You can hold the control key down and remove those from the selection set. Okay. Um, if you haven't done the rubber duck uh, exercise in the level one training guide, uh, you might want to take a look at that if you're interested in the control point editing. Also, the penguin exercise in the getting started is something you want to take a look at. But what I want to, to do right now is uh, open up your homework. So I bet you didn't think you'd have homework in this class, but you do. Um, there um, is a file called uh, Surfaces or I can't remember if it's called surfaces or all surfaces on your download, but um, either one will uh, will work. With uh, this one, you can create um, each one of the surfaces that we have in this file. So use your help file um, and your help window over here and do a surface from edge curves, and I'll give you a hint how that would work. Um, up here under surface from edge curves, you can create a surface from all four of these curves. Notice how the help updates with help on edge surf. You can find out where that command is here and you can watch the video. Okay, so for homework, again, surface, you can extrude straight here, and as you start the command, it brings up help on that command. Okay, so make sure you have the help window open. Um, you can do that up here under help and it's called command help. Okay, so that is homework. Uh, there's some review of surfaces, some new ones to, uh, to take a look at, but by the time you do all nine of those surfaces, you will have a very good idea what your options are in Rhino. Okay, um, I want to open our project for the day. It's uh, getting uh, a little late here, called Fire Station Start. Okay, and I'm going to start here with uh, the plan. And if you've downloaded uh, the PDF, then uh, you can take, uh, take a look at it. Um, we'll start with the plan and then we'll do the elevations and I'll, we'll move our way into a solid model. Okay, so 
uh, let me um, go ahead and start with the layers here. And we've got uh, some layers created for you in this file. So it's really um, important to download it. It will save you some time. It's called Fire Station Start. And uh, I'm on the curves layer. And I want to start out with just doing the, the floor plate and then we'll do uh, elevation curves, and then we'll turn them into surfaces and solids. I'm just going to uh, mute out for a second here and take uh, a sip of water, and you can uh, download that to file fire station start. I'm actually filling in for another instructor that was supposed to do the getting started today, so I didn't have much uh, uh, much warning here. Um, and uh, uh, just bear with me. I haven't done this uh, particular exercise in a while, but I'm sure we're all friends now. I'll be able to uh, to get through it. Um, and uh, what I need to do is draw the polyline curve that will set the floor plan and then we'll uh, do the walls and then we'll just develop this model. So um, we don't do, or I should say, we haven't done an architectural uh, example in the getting started. So if it turns out good, this will be uh, a good option to have out there on the getting, uh, getting started page. Um, it's probably not as beautiful as you can do if you're an architect, but um, it will certainly give you an idea how you can approach this type of model. We have lots of product design examples. If you're more of a product designer, then looking at the previous getting started will, uh, will be helpful. Uh, and I would like to do a jewelry getting started here um, in the next uh, few months. Hopefully we'll get that uh, going as well. So uh, let's start with a polyline. And I want to uh, just show you what the unit of the model is here. So if you look down in your status bar, it is inches. So the base unit is inches. To specify feet, we need the foot mark. So um, just uh, keep that uh, in mind. If we need foot, we'll put in uh, the foot mark and let me show you some of the options that you have. So I'll take polyline and I'll start here where it tells, uh, tells me uh, to start. And notice how helpful that cursor tooltip is. So let's just you know have a silent round of applause for the cursor tooltip. I'm heading off uh, in the direction here, vertical. And um, uh, we, we can reset the grid, so don't worry about that. We can draw off the grid. Uh, the first distance that I want to type in is 61. And if I don't put anything, I'm going to end up with inches. So I really need to put my foot mark here. And when I do, I can zoom out. And you can see what I said, that we, we are off the grid. But, uh, but don't worry, it, it, will be, uh, it will be fine. I'll pick up here. And so that uh, first distance was 61 feet. The second distance that I want to use is 65 feet, 2 inches. So I'll type in 2, and then I'll drag my cursor off here. Notice how I typed it in. And uh, I didn't need the inch mark. It assumed inches. Um, and also, it didn't... Um, I wasn't going a half an inch or a quarter of an inch. If I were, I would put in the dash. So let me undo that. And uh, I'll type in 61 feet. And then when I pick over here, uh, I'll type in 65 feet, 2 and 1 half inch. Okay, that would work. Okay, I can put in the inch mark. That would be okay too. I can leave it out altogether, but the dash is telling Rhino that you're going from a whole inch to a partial inch. Okay, it has nothing to do with formatting what you're going to see on the dimension. 
um, you'll have your dash in the proper place. But this is how you format for Rhino. Um, and similarly, if you uh, want to put in three meters, you certainly can. Okay, now if your model isn't in meters, then by putting in the M, then Rhino will convert feet to meters. Okay, so keep, uh, keep that in mind. Okay, I keep on doing back too far, but lots of practice here. How about 65 foot 2? Enter and pick. Okay, we'll also go down 61 feet and pick, and we'll close back up to the beginning point. Okay, so that's the floor um, plate that, uh, that we'll be using. If we pick it and we go to analyze mass property and area, we can get the area in the current units. But square inches doesn't mean much to me. I don't know about you. So what I'm going to do instead is take area. And notice off here to the right, it says model units. I'm going to pick on that and set the area to foot. Okay, and when I set it to foot and I pick on the curve, then I get the area in the current units. And we're used to seeing area in square feet. So we have our building is going to be just under 4,000 square feet. So hopefully that gives you uh, a nice idea of what we have going here. So I'm going to leave that and I'm going to draw the elevations. And I can draw them in the front view, I can draw them in the top view. Uh, I can use Gumball to rotate them if I drew them in, in the top view. Um, but uh, let's go ahead to the front view. And if you hit uh, F7, you can turn off the grid if it's getting in uh, the way. You can also make the grid bigger by uh, going into options. And in options, uh, right now we have a grid count of 50 and a line spacing of 12. I'm going to change the line spacing to 24. And the, uh, oh, I picked on uh, the wrong one here. I'll, I'll leave snap spacing set to one. That's fine. Um, but I want to change the grid spacing from every minor line being at one unit, there we go, to being every 24 units. Okay, and now 50 is, is pretty good. Okay, let's start with the uh, elevation. I'm going to move this into position. Maybe we want to do 100 here instead of 50. Then we have enough to... Um, lay under the work that we'll be doing. I find it helpful, especially in the beginning of a model, um, but I'll let you decide. Okay, so I'm going to go to the front view, and I want to draw the elevation. So it's going to start out as a polyline curve, and I'll just uh, pick a point. If you have a specific point in mind, you can type in the coordinate. Um, the first uh, side here will be 35 feet, one inch, great. Okay. And the next uh, distance will be 40 feet. Okay. And then eight foot two. And you'll see what uh, we're, uh, we're doing here in a moment, 24 feet. And then I want to come down 23 feet 3 inches. And I want to come all the way down here to the bottom. But I don't have that dimension. Okay, So what I'm going to do is turn on something called Smart Track. And using the O-Snap, I'm going to track to that point. And also having Ortho on is, uh, is helpful to track vertical. Okay, so it looks like I'm coming down an additional 20 feet. Okay, so um, with that information, if I wanted to type in 20 feet to be more uh, exact, I can. And uh, let's uh, take a look at the, uh, the openings here. I'm going to go over 6 foot 6. 
and I'll undo that. I'm going to turn off Smart Track. It ended up, I think, snapping to uh, to something or measuring from one of the other points. So sometimes Smart Track isn't very smart. It can get in the way. So we have to know when to uh, turn it off and turn it on. Uh, I want this to be seven foot eleven high by seven foot and then down seven foot eleven I hope uh, in a few moments here this will start uh, making uh, a lot more sense eleven foot two is our next distance and this door will be seven foot eleven but it will be a four foot door down seven foot eleven over three feet up seventeen foot eleven this is an overhead door twelve foot wide down seventeen foot eleven over six foot, up 12 foot. Actually, that was 17 foot 11. There we go, I'll correct that, very easy. Feet, and I could use a smart track here or just come back down 17 foot 11, and the last thing I'll do is close that up. Okay, so we're starting to see the uh, elevation. Um, I have uh, a little bit of work to do to fix this up. I want to draw a line from endpoint to endpoint here. Okay, and I'll explode this into its uh, component parts. There we go. Okay, so now I have a line that will set the angle of the roof. And I want to come down 23 foot 3 inches and come over to the right. I'll snap onto, the, onto uh, that location. And I need one more line here. And this line I will create by offsetting. If I explode that, um, offsetting 8 feet. Okay, so let's go to curve and offset the curve. That would be one uh, command that we haven't looked at yet, so it's good to uh, show. Offset 8 feet. Offset 6 feet looks a little better. So now I have uh, a curve setting that distance. Offset can be really important when creating uh, floor plans uh, as well as elevations. And I want to draw a line from here to here. Okay. Now, another option that I have here that I think works really well uh, instead of going through and creating the uh, geometry is, uh, is this. I can take this line and mirror it to the other side and move it from here to here. Okay. And now that I have that line, I can trim it. Now it's the exact same angle as the line on the other side. And I do like that option a lot. So I'm going to take fill it and fill it at a radius of zero is a great way to trim up these lines. Another option is to use trim. And trim, I'll pick on these two lines, enter, and then pick what I want to go away. So that's another very good option. So. Um, one more set of windows that we need to create, and we'll use Smart Track here. And I want to track up five feet. And uh, I want to, I could also track and line it up with uh, one of these other edges. Okay, and I'll pick uh, that point. And the other corner, so it's starting at that location. Length or other corner, I want this window to be four feet by five feet. Okay, 
And I think I'll drag those windows up here. I want them to be uh, towards the top of the uh, elevation. I could also move them. And there um, is, I could use the, uh, the gumball to move down, let's say, minus two feet. Okay and to come up with an exact location. Now, I also want to take this mirror, uh, this window and mirror it to the other side. And then I'll take both of them and copy it from this corner of the door to the other corner of the door. Okay, I think we have our elevation, we have our openings, and I'm going to join this together into one curve. Another option I have after joining is to group these together so that it'll be easy to move them. So I'll go ahead and group them. And um, sometimes uh, the perspective view gives us the best place to move. Um, or distance from window to wall. Yeah, use your distance command to uh, to come up uh, with that. So if you go analyze distance from the edge of the window to the wall. Now notice the O snap is trying to bring me down to the center of the polyline. So I'm going to turn that off. I'll turn on perpendicular and I have two foot four. Okay, so I have two foot four from uh, the wall to the window. Okay. And there's also an O snap. I always think of these things, but I'm never sure how far in a getting started to drag everyone. But here's a command called midpoint. So one of the options that you have to, here is to pick all the windows. And right now I have them grouped, so I have to ungroup them. So let's move the windows from the midpoint, but I want it to snap between the top edge of the roof and the door. Okay, so um, I'll pick on near and I'll pick here and I should have picked between. I talked about it but never did it. Okay, there we go. Okay, between Okay, and I want to pick the midpoint from here Doesn't seem to want to do what I want. I know why. I know why. Okay, move from here. There we go. It helps to pick the right button. Between. There we go. I was I was picking on midpoint, which wasn't what I wanted. From here to here. Okay, angels sing, and we have what we were looking for. So now we know the distance from here to here, and we can get the distance from here to here. So Rhino can be as accurate as uh, as you want. So that's six foot three and seven eighths. But what if you wanted it to be six, uh, six foot off of that door? Okay, well, one of the options is to offset a curve. You can tell I like this stuff because I, uh, I just can't answer a simple question. Okay, so I'm going to draw, I'm going to offset the curve six feet. Okay, so now I can see that the corner of the window, or at least the window opening that I'm showing, I am going to put a block in here. Um, is not exactly six feet. So I'll go ahead and move that down now that I know where that offset line is. So offset ge geometry is totally appropriate and uh, it's a good way to check your model um, in it as well as build it. Okay, so what do we have to do? We got to join these together and then we have to regroup them and now we're going to move them down into position. So I'll take move and I'll pick on the corner here and in the perspective view, which is eclipsed by the OSNAP toolbar, okay, I want to move this down. Okay, so when I do that, I notice that the elevation is a little bit shorter than the plan. So I have one of two options here. I can bring the plan back to the elevation or I can bring the elevation to the plan. I think I will um, go ahead and stretch using the control points and I can move them from here to here. Okay, so now it's perfect. Now it lines up with that plan. The um, 
control um, control grid uh, editing is uh, is real uh, powerful in Rhino. Um, the other thing I could do is to um, and one thing I'm noticing, and I want to check up here um, in the top view. Okay, it looks like we're lined up. We're just not on. The perspective is uh, set to perspective two point. So it's, uh, I'll set it probably back when I do the uh, rendering, but uh, we, we are off the x-axis, but we're off there consistently. Okay, I could move everything so it lined up with the x-axis. It's not necessary. Okay, but so let's do that control plane editing again. Grab both control points, move, and move that to the corner. Okay, I think we're good. Uh, let's maximize that view for you and copy or mirror, either one. Um, you uh, you can do here transform copy I'll pick it up here and copy it here okay now one of the problems though with this elevation is I don't want the doors and windows so you're gonna see another kind of neat thing as far as control point editing goes you can highlight the control points and delete them so for these openings that I don't want in the polyline I can just hit delete now, maybe I did too many. Maybe I, I need a small exit door for egress, but I'm going to delete the overhead doors. Okay, very easy to control point edit. Okay, and who doesn't want a few windows on that elevation? I do. I want more light in. Okay, so that's looking uh, good. Um, we're still doing a wireframe. And we'll turn it into uh, a surface here in a moment. But uh, let's create the other uh, wall curves that, uh, that we need. So uh, up under curve, rectangle, three point. So I'll create a three point rectangle for this wall. And I'll create a three point rectangle for this wall. Okay. And how about another one? We'll go from here to here. To here. Okay, so we pretty much have the wireframe. Let's go ahead and start building our wall surfaces. So um, I will make the wall layer current and up under surface, I have surface from planar curves. Okay, and I'll pick this one and then enter. Beautiful. Okay, now, now that um, We've seen that the first time. I'll go ahead and pick these other closed planar curves and I'll turn them into a surface. So you can see how the uh, model is coming along very uh, quickly uh, here just by uh, using okay, that, uh, that surface command. Um, you can Take the window curves and mirror them to the other side, or you can just draw some rectangles. So I'll leave that to you on your own, but you might want to develop the other uh, uh, elevations here with, uh, with a few, uh, few more windows. Um, I will add a few more to, uh, to this uh, uh, front elevation. So let me uh, go ahead and ungroup this. Right now, because of the group, I can't ungroup there we go I can't select the the window so I'll select those and I'll mirror them over to and I can do that actually to both the elevations so let's uh, go back here to transform and mirror and I'll pick here when I mirror in 45 degrees I get them on the other elevation and I can do that here as well great now we'll have to trim out those openings and we may want to um, take these two here just for symmetry and mirror them over the midpoint of that, uh, of that surface. 
start of mirror plane here. And let me go uh, into the uh, right viewport. There we go. And pick. Okay. And I could probably use that same set of windows to trim both surfaces. Okay, so we've got, uh, we could also array them to, um, to get uh, a consistent spacing. Now that we have uh, the curve, I could take uh, both of these curves and let's do another mirror. Okay, so I'll pick here and here, and I think I'll just uh, go with, uh, with those two and I'll use them on both sides. Okay, so I have to trim both of those elevations. Okay, so there's our curves and let's uh, trim. So when I take trim, it says select object to trim and I want to trim out that inside surface. I'm looking at purple on the other side, so it's a little bit deceiving, but uh, I'll show you in a second that we are trimming out uh, that area. Now, what happened on the other side is that when we trimmed, it ended up reaching through and trimming that other surface. So let's uh, undo to bring uh, those back. And when we trim this time, we'll be a little bit more careful not to pick on that back surface. Okay, so that looks good. I did uh, want to uh, trim the back surface. The uh, right viewport, if I put it in shaded mode, is probably the best place to do that. There we go. So now I have windows on all four sides. Okay, um, natural light, artificial light, that's up to your renderer. So um, you do want to build your model to um, have openings in it that will allow the light to go in, but the render algorithm will determine whether um, it's just cooking up a picture or if there's a real sun. We do have a sun here uh, in Rhino that I'll show you in a moment. Okay, we have some roofs to do and we have some windows uh, to do. So let's go ahead and work on uh, the roof right now. This is a collection of surfaces. If you wanted to make it into a solid, then um, there's uh, an offset surface option that I think does a pretty good job. So I'll pick all four of those sides and I will join them into a poly surface. And up under solid, there's a offset, and I can offset with solid equal to yes, and I can offset it onto or into the inside. Okay, so what's the distance? I'll put in six, which is six inches, and I'll turn Smart Track off because it can kind of drive me crazy after a while, and solid equals yes. Otherwise, I would just be getting the surface, not the solid. And when I pick on it, this, uh, this one got left out, but we'll do that one in individually. I may not have joined it, or it may have had a problem joining. Okay, so let's try that one more time, join, and then we'll do Okay, I just didn't join it. That's definitive now. Okay, offset, flip, solid equals yes, distance equals six, and that should be, let's look under properties, a closed poly surface. Now, if you were going to 3D print it, then you would have to take into account what the minimum distance here would be after you scale it down. So it would probably be too thin right now to get a decent 3D print out of. Okay, let's do one more offset. So off a surface, offset surface, flip direction, six, solid equals yes. And now we have a separate surface here for, uh, uh, for this wall that we can union into the main part. Or we could leave it separate if we want it to be 
a separate material. It is solid, so it would 3D print. Okay. So either, either way, you can union it or keep it separate. Let's take a look at the roof. So up under the roof layer, we'll make it current. And I need a polyline for the roof. The um, curves that we have on the curve layer, I can turn those off. And for the uh, roof, I'll take polyline and I'll pick um, on all four corners. Now that would be one option. The other option that I have is to extract the curve. And that way, I don't have to worry about, you know, which corner that we're snapping on. Are we getting the right corner? I can extract the curves and join them together. So that would be another way to approach this. But more or less, I think that will, uh, will work fine for the roof. And I'll pick, I just want to make sure I'm picking on the outside. There we go. And here, here and here, and then close. Great, okay. So I have two, um, two polylines now that I can use for, for the roof. I'll pick on the curve. And the um, overhang, I'd need to determine here either accurately or um, I could, you know, use gumball to help um, extend the uh, the roof overhang but I think I'll just go up here to offset curve and offset the curve by two feet uh, maybe three feet there we go and we'll see if we like it okay so there's a three foot overhang on all sides uh, you know I'm thinking it needs to be four feet so it's a pretty big uh, pretty big building and we'll have to maybe do um, uh, more than we would do on a residential plan. Okay, so there's a four foot overhang for that roof. It's not a surface yet. It will be here in uh, in a moment. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, grab uh, this curve. And let's do the same thing. This curve, um, I do have to move because it's offsetting on the inside. The other thing I could do would be to create geometry to trim it down. And maybe turning off the walls would be uh, a good way to, uh, to do that. I need something to, uh, to trim to. And one of the options I have here is to explode this and to take this line and using the gumball extend it and trim using that curve. Okay, so that's going to give me a better curve to, uh, and I'll fill at the corners. We'll turn the walls back on, and this curve I don't need either. Okay, turn the walls back on. Great. Okay, so I've got my roof curves. Let's go ahead and make the roof solids. Okay, so up under surface, We'll do a surface from planar curve. We'll do here and here. And I've got the first one. This one, though, I didn't join, so I'll have to do that first. And then we'll do another surface from planar curve, and that looks good. Uh, we do need to extrude it into a solid. So um, right now, it's just a surface. Surface, extrude. Um, we actually want extrude off of solid because we want it to be a solid extrude um, straight select the uh, surface to extrude surface extrude I'm sorry solid extrude surface straight I'll pick on the surface okay and when I extrude it it extrudes perpendicular to that surface and that's not what I want Okay, so for this, I want to change the direction. And to, uh, to change the uh, direction, um, we can use the direction option here. And I need to get into one of my parallel viewports, and I'll point vertical. 
Okay, and now I'm extruding it. What distance do we want to extrude it? Uh, I'm going to uh, put in one foot six. Great. Okay, so that was solid, extrude surface straight, pick on the surface, and we need to change the direction. Use your parallel view. You're only picking a direction. The distance will come in here, 18 inches. Okay, so the last thing I want to do here is uh, uh, put my windows and my doors in. I have them prepared as blocks. Again, um, there is lots of information to help, a lot of tutorials, but for uh, an hour and a half to two hour uh, getting started that I've already kind of gone over time with, um, I have to have a few things ready. So uh, I'll go ahead and make uh, a new layer to insert my blocks onto. Those of you that have used, used other CAD already know a lot about blocks, even though you might not know a lot about Rhino or think you know a lot about Rhino right now. They're just like other CAD applications. They're groups of objects that we can bring together, give them a name, and insert them into our model. The block definition can be changed and all of the inserts or instances of the blocks will update. And that's the power of blocks. You can also count them. So if I go to insert right now, and I go to a list of blocks that I have in this model. I'm going to start with the 18 foot door. I'll pick OK and I'll bring it in. Okay, and I'll pick the insertion point on the corner of the wall. And we now have our overhead door. And I'll do that another time. Again, insert it on the corner of the wall. I also have a um, 48 inch door. So I'll bring that one in here. And I have a double door, 72 inch double door. And I'll bring that here, okay? And I have a few more uh, windows uh, here to do as well. See how wonderful it is when you have these blocks already ready. Um, and it may take you a while to develop your block libraries. Now the only thing that I want to do here is show you an option that is important to uh, uh, look at when you're inserting to make sure you're inserting as a block. And it is possible to insert and insert individual objects, but then you won't have that property of updating. So uh, make sure that as you're inserting here that you'll be inserting block instances. So let me just pop these in literally uh, one more time and we'll grab that double door. Um, you can make your own libraries of doors. A lot of manufacturers have them for you to download. So uh, uh, take a look out there. There's uh, already a lot that uh, that has been done on sites that give architectural resources. There we go. Now you want to be careful, you know, which side of the a wall that you pick on. Zooming in is a really good thing to do, and I want to get it on the outside of that wall. Okay, so you can see I have a little bit uh, of work here to uh, pop in these blocks and after huh, that one is just really really stubborn so maybe zooming in a little bit here there we go okay so I've got my front elevation done I've got my roof the other thing that I've done here in this model is uh, I have added the materials already to the layers so uh, if you look at the uh, walls we have a material, we have um, plastic and glass. So um, you can see that's already been done to the layer. The objects are reflecting the materials of the layer. So uh, let's turn on with the magic of uh, the completed model. Let's turn on a few layers. And uh, let's take a look at how, how far we are. So I'll put it in render preview mode. 
And when I do, you can see that uh, we have our basic materials assigned to the object. We have floorboard material assigned to the fence. You're still seeing the curves because I'm showing them, but uh, you could uh, select all the curves or turn off the curve layer cell. CRV is a great way to select the curves and hide them. Also, take a look at your environment. We set that to Rhino Sky. You can add environments with your environment panel. And uh, this is an HDRI image. There's many, uh, there's many um, options for downloading HDRIs, including the Food for Rhino site. Okay. And I haven't turned on the ground plane, so let's go find the ground plane here. And we'll turn that on. It already has a grass uh, material assigned to it. And I'll hide the leader that, uh, that I have here. And if I rotate it up, I'm looking at it uh, from the perspective view, but I could also look at it from a two-point perspective. And a lot of fun things you can do with the fence from array to using flow along surface, but um, I'll have to leave this model up now to you and your creativity because you can insert a fire truck. You can have uh, a lot of fun just uh, developing this model. Now, what I haven't done here is render it. So if I pick render, um, it will actually cook up the image file that we can save off. And when we pick render, notice that there are no curves that, uh, uh, that are rendering. It's just the geometry. So a real simple model, a simple rendering just to get you started. Uh, there's lots of uh, videos uh, out there and, and training that, uh, that not only we offer, but um, also our authorized Rhino trainers and training centers. So um, let me know if you need any um, direction or resources. But uh, today was really uh, zero to 60. So we could have come from not knowing, you know, anything about Rhino to now being able to create a simple model. And uh, it's a simple architectural example. I can't say that enough because we can get really complex, as complex as you want to be. Uh, and also add-ons like Grasshopper are going to add the generative component so you can very quickly um, uh, cook up multiple preliminary kind of designs to be decided on. So thank you for uh, joining the training today. Uh, let's go ahead and see if there are any questions. You can uh, either raise your hand, which tells me that you would like me to unmute your mic, or you can type in your question. And I'm going to go ahead and stop the video.